This is uh, Dr. Muhammad, and I'm going to talk uh, in this um, in this video uh, about the still dynamic analysis fundamentals for seismic design, and I'm going to talk about response uh, spectrum part four. So let's go into the details of this. Let's assume. Okay. So I think that in in uh, this um, video we are going to continue from what or from where that we have stopped last time uh, last time we were talking about response spectrum concept and we have explained about the meaning of uh, combined response spectrum uh, and we mentioned about what is the relation between the different components of the response spectrum and today or in this video I'm going to talk about the uh, characteristics of response spectrum we're going to talk about the sensitive regions or the regions which is going to be sensitive for specific component uh, or engineering demand parameter on the response spectrum and I'm going after that to give some examples to highlight uh, the main ideas that I have explained in this video okay let's go Let's go first with the characteristics of response spectrum. <clears throat> first of all, um, we need to understand that uh, there are some important properties of earthquake response spectra in general. Uh, whenever that we are plotting any response spectrum, as you can see it here, we are facing something uh, that is commonly um, uh, encountered whenever we design our um, our structure or trying to find the peak components from our response spectrum that you are going to find first of all for some region that there is some uh, we can say the response or the peak uh, response or the peak value of the uh, uh, response spectrum is related directly to um, to the acceleration of uh, or the peak acceleration which means that peak acceleration of the ground motion and we are going to find that in another part there is another region where that the response of the spectrum is highly sensitive to the velocity of the input ground motion and <clears throat> we are going to find another region on the response spectrum that the displacement the peak displacement of the system is highly sensitive to the displacement of the input motion. So this means what? Whenever that we have our input motion, okay, uh, we are going to find that this input motion, if we are going to talk about uh, El Centro, we are going to draw the tripart uh, tripartite uh, response spectrum, as you can see it here, and we are going to find that for some areas there are some uh, the points on some specific areas are going to be relevant to the acceleration this means that if the acceleration of the input is going to be changed then the acceleration of the single degree freedom system or the response spectrum is going to be changed directly let's in in increase let's uh, deepen our understanding regarding this issue in more detail let's assume that we have a central response spectrum as you can see it here okay first let's assume that we are going to examine a point called a as you can see it is plotted here a is this point on the response spectrum which is for a natural period of 0.03 okay when we look to the values of this point on the displacement uh, axis and the acceleration axis you are going to find that this point is having very small value for displacement right because this is the displacement axis this is point 0.1 point oh 0.01 this is point 0.1 and then it's logarithmic scale so this one is very small almost almost zero right very near to zero because it's less than 0.01 and in the same time if you are going to look to this value on the 
acceleration axis, you're going to find that it is here, right? It is here. This is actually similar to the input response spectrum itself. I'm going to make this one here. So this is the value of the acceleration. For very short natural period system, what is happening is something like this. The single degree freedom system is very stiff. Whenever the natural period is very small, this means that the stiffness of the this equivalent single degree freedom or this single degree freedom system is very high. This means that the mass and the ground, they are going to move as one body, as if it is rigid body motion. You understand? This is why, because the natural period of the system is very small. This means that the system is very rigid. Okay? Very rigid. This means that the, uh, the deformation of the ground, which is represented by the ground motion, which is the fixed support here that is moving from here to here, this displacement is going to be the same exactly as the mass or the total displacement. There is no relative displacement at all. There is no relative displacement. So if we consider this system, which is 0.03 seconds system, for this system, the pseudo acceleration approaches the ground acceleration while the displacement d is very small. Okay, because here, this is the, the ground. Actually, this is the same exactly the same exactly as the ground acceleration because here this plot it is for the response spectrum for El Centro as we said so any change any change in this response spectrum going up or going down in this direction then it will make direct a reflection on the acceleration axis right so that's the point here why we say that that A approaches the ground acceleration while the displacement D is very small. The pseudo acceleration almost the same as the pseudo acceleration of the, of the system, similar as the ground acceleration, as ground acceleration. Okay? So in this case, we are going to find the acceleration are the same for the ground and for, for the system. Okay? Even that U is going to be the same here but it's very small as we said it's going to be very small so it's negligible our main concern is u double dot which is the acceleration so there is a physical reasoning for this trend for purposes of dynamic analysis a very short period system is extremely stiff that's our main point here. it is extremely stiff and may be considered essentially rigid okay such a system would move rigidly with the ground as if it is part of the ground itself as i said it is like as if it is uh, rigid body motion thus its peak acceleration would be approximately equal to the ground acceleration that's the point here that whenever that whenever that we are saying that this is the ground acceleration and there is maximum value for it this is the maximum if we say this is u double dot g which is for the acceleration uh, of the time history record of the earthquake then this peak value of the time history record would be the same peak value for the system itself because, why because it moves rigidly as if the system is moving rigidly so this is very sensitive to the acceleration okay rigid system acceleration at top is nearly equal to the ground acceleration yes okay that's the meaning of the first part so whenever that we look to this we're going to find this is true look to this part of the curve it is something like this right it is almost almost perpendicular to the acceleration whenever the part of the response spectrum is perpendicular to one axis then the structure is going to be very sensitive to the axis um, engineering demand parameter or this axis component okay for example here almost the 
response spectrum is uh, perpendicular to the velocity axis. So this means this, this region from C to D, it is sensitive to the velocity. And at the end, almost this part is like this, which is perpendicular to this axis, which is displacement axis. This means from part P or point B to the right, it is very sensitive to the displacement. Sensitive means that the change in displacement of the ground motion will be reflected directly to the displacement of the system. So the peak displacement of the earthquake will be the peak displacement of the system. Here, this means the peak velocity of the ground acceleration would equal or will be related directly to the peak acceleration of the system. Similarly here, this part, the peak uh, acceleration of the ground motion would be equal and most related to the peak acceleration of the system. Okay, now let's go to the second part. Next we examine a with a very long period. Now let's go and jump to the very right of the system. Before we were talking about A, now we're going to talk about this point here. Point where natural period is 10. What is happening here? 10 means what? The system is so flexible. The ground is going to move and the mass is going to be lagging behind. Why? Because this column is very flexible. T is very long. So if we have T and equal to 10 seconds, the acceleration A, and thus the force in the structure, which is related to the mass time, the acceleration, would be very small. That's very true. Look here. Look to this point and make get the projection here this is the value of the acceleration it's very small okay this is the acceleration here this is one for example and then we are in a logarithmic scale so this means that we are in uh, short or it is very small uh, value however for the displacement okay however for the displacement you are going to find that it is going to be higher value here. This is where the displacement axis, I'm sorry, this is the displacement. Okay, So here, this means that we are having the same value, Okay, the same value, the maximum displacement of the system is going to be the maximum displacement of the ground motion. Again, there is a physical reasoning for this trend. A very long period system is extremely flexible. Therefore, the mass at top would remain stationary. That's the point here. It would remain as if it is stationary. While the base moves with ground below. While the base moves with the ground below. Flexible system structure response is most directly related to ground displacement. As I said here, it is most, as we said, the curve shape is almost perpendicular to the displacement axis. Then it is it is related and sensitive to displacement okay but here in this region until this point this was related to acceleration because it's perpendicular to the acceleration while this region from c to d as we are going to see it is highly related to the pseudo velocity pseudo velocity okay flexible system structure response is most directly related to the ground displacement the relative displacement is equal to the ground displacement. However, the acceleration of the mass is zero, or almost zero, okay? Or almost near so. Thus, the force in the structure related to MA is going to be very small, right? Because the acceleration here is very small, okay? So this is the reasoning for flexible systems. Reasoning for flexible systems. Okay, so now, based on this, we can, like, give this three regions that I have highlighted acceleration sensitive velocity sensitive and displacement sensitive okay so I hope that this is clear for for us okay 
now we can we're going to talk about about this for the acceleration sensitive part the short period region to the lift of point C which is this is point C and this is the lift part which is acceleration sensitive called the acceleration sensitive region because structure response is most directly related to ground acceleration so that's what I have explained before okay because here if you if you consider that any any change in this response spectrum to be here for example or here for example that this means that the direct change in the acceleration this means that the direct change in time history record acceleration would make direct change on the system spectral acceleration okay and now for the second part which is the velocity sensitive part between point C and D the intermediate period region between point C and D called the velocity sensitive region because the structure response appears to be better related to ground velocity than to other ground motion parameters okay highly linked to to it okay the change if this if this point goes here this means that this is direct change in velocity right so that's why we say that this part is velocity sensitive and here this is the last part which is long period range uh, region to the right of point D this is point D okay called the displacement sensitive region because structure response is most directly related to ground displacement in this case okay as I said, you can remember it as the part or the segment of the curve that is perpendicular to an axis is very sensitive to this axis component. Here, this is acceleration, perpendicular to the acceleration axis. Here, this is velocity sensitive because it is perpendicular to velocity axis. Here, it is displacement sensitive because it is perpendicular to the displacement axis here. Okay, we can remember it easily by this um, by this uh, notice okay okay difference between design and actual response spectrum what is the difference between between the two okay difference between design and actual response spectrum there are two differences actually the first one is the response spectrum for a given earthquake this is for given earthquake means that only one earthquake like this one for example we have actual recorded response spectrum for real earthquake El Centro for example or Northridge or Imperial Valley or something like this you're going to find that it's not you know we call it like jagged uh, plot it's not not smooth okay it is jagged plot it is a unique plot representative of the particular ground motion this is for only one particular ground motion okay the design spectrum, on the other hand, design spectrum, as you can see here, this is undamped response curve, smooth one. It is, you can find it smooth. And here also it is very smooth. Okay. However, a smooth plot specifying the level of seismic force as a function of systems peri period and damping ratio. So this is where we're going to talk about the smooth response spectrum later on. But anyway, the most distinguishing part from this difference that you have one that is not smooth and the design is very smooth and I'm going to talk why this one is smooth okay because we are averaging many uh, response spectra so it is smooth for this reason okay the second difference is the design spectrum is an envelope of envelope of two or more different elastic spectra judged to be consequence in affecting ground motions at given site what is the meaning of this Actually, whenever that we give response spectrum or design response spectrum, we want to cover to cover different levels of earthquakes. For example, if you look to this curve, okay, this one here, this one like this, going here and going here, this one. This is moderate size earthquake at small distance from site. But if you look to this one, this one here, this one, okay this one it is medium size earthquake at moderate distance from site ok 
Okay, so we have this. And if you look to this one, we're going to find this one here. This is another one which is for large earthquake at large distance from the site. So whenever that we are going to have T here, so which one that we should take? This one or this one or this one? So it should be the envelope, which is this one. But if we're going to take about or talk about the point here, then we have three points here and here and here. Then we should take this one. So this considered to be like envelope for all of them. After determining the design spectrum for each of the postulated earthquakes, the design spectrum for the site is developed by enveloping the design spectra for all earthquakes considered for the site. This is the meaning of the design response spectrum. The meaning of design response spectrum. Okay, now let's go to the example so that we can get more insight into what we have explained. Okay, let's go with example one. We are having a 12 feet long vertical cantilever. As you can see here, we have 12 inch, and we have, this is the cantilever, and we have a mass on the top, which is single degree freedom system, four inch pipes. It is a four inch nominal diameter standard steel pipe, as you can see, and it supports uh, 5,200 pounds weight attached at the tip as shown here. Okay. The properties of the pipe are outside diameter 4.5 inches, inside diameter 4.026, thickness 0.23, and the second moment of cross-sectional area, I, 7.23, elastic modulus, it is 29,000 KSI, and the weight is 10.2. 79 pound per foot of length this is of the column so each each foot length it weighs 10.79 okay determine the peak deformation and bending stress in the cantilever due to the ill central ground motion and assume damping ratio to be two percent okay so we want to know if we have an earthquake here which is L central what is the peak deformation and bending stress in the cantilever? Bending will be here maximum. And what is the maximum displacement here? We want to check this. Okay, so now let's go to the solution. First, before anything, I want to let you know what we are going to do. The strategy is that we need for this system to get something important, which is Tn the natural period of this system the natural period of this system okay the natural period of this system and in order to get the natural period as we said before so if you remember that we said that omega equals to 2 pi over t n right and this omega it equals to square root, sorry, k over m. Okay, this is the main thing that we should put in our mind. This is the main, the most famous dynamic characteristic for single degree freedom system. So first of all, we need to obtain the stiffness of the column. And we want to know the mass, which is already given to us through the weight. And then we're going to calculate omega n, which is natural circular frequency, using this equation or this simple rule, rule of thumb. And then we're going to obtain Tn. So this is the sequence of our solution. This is 1, then the mass number 2, then the circular frequency 3, and then we're going to end up with the Tn, which is the natural period. What then? What is the natural period after that? What we're going to do? We're going into exactly the response spectrum using the natural period then we are going to obtain the displacement and the acceleration and then we can get the peak deformation as is okay and then from the acceleration we can obtain the forces right the forces at the top of the cantilever we can obtain it 
because this force is going to be the acceleration time the mass right this is what we're going to do. so this is the philosophy of solving this example let's go into the details of the example first of all we have the lateral stiffness of the single degree freedom system is 3 EI over L to the power 3 this is from structural mechanics you know it well so we have Young's modulus here we have the inertia given to us 7.2 and we have the L which is 12 times 12 because this is conversion from feet to inches take care take care of the units huh? so we have this value which is 0.211 kips per inch this is the stiffness then we want to get the weight of the of the uh, of the system the total weight of the pipe is 10.79 times 12 if you remember this is the weight per uh, the weight per yes which is this one here the weight per foot length 10.79 so here which is 10.79 times 12 inch okay uh, sorry 12 12 feet so we have 10 times 12 it is the total weight of the column itself but we have the top lumped weight at the top it's 5200 which is very high compared to this so we can neglect this one it is very small to to the weight or the mass so we have the mass actually here the mass is highly concentrated here we have a mass also for the column but it's very small it is 100 something here it is 5200 so we can neglect the mass of the column and then the mass it is going to be 5.2 also virgin because we are going to use kip kilo pounds over 386 which is the gravitational acceleration in imperial units remember this okay then we are going to have our m so we have k we have m right now okay okay then the natural vibration the natural vibration frequency and period of the system is this is the natural frequency the radical or square root of k over m this is k here and this is m already obtained it then we can obtain the value in rad per second then tn is going to be 1.59 okay remember that omega n as i said equals to 2 pi over tn then you can obtain tn easily it is almost 1.6 seconds okay now the second step is we want the peak deformation remember that the main thing that we want what yes peak deformation this is requirement number one and bending stresses Peak deformation means that we need D, the maximum displacement. Bending stresses, we need the maximum what? Exactly, the maximum acceleration. Because acceleration time mass, it is going to be given F. And this F is going to be multiplied by the height, okay, which is going to give us the moment at the end. So the first requirement re needs D, the maximum displacement. And the second requirement needs the maximum acceleration. Okay. Now, so we go with natural period, 1.59. Then this curve already given for us. It should be given to you. Okay. So do not worry about this curve. It should be provided for you. This is 1.59, which is the natural period of the uh, system. Then we are going to this point in the curve and we are having four scale uh, tripartite response spectrum so here we can find that this value this is d here we have d five inches this is the maximum huh? we are talking about the peak of course and here this is the acceleration which is 0.2 g so the maximum displacement is five inches the maximum acceleration Okay, it is 0.2. Remember that we are talking about pseudo acceleration, but now we, we understood what is the meaning and what is the difference between pseudo acceleration and true acceleration. They are almost the same. Okay, so this is the, the point. From the response spectrum curve for damping ratio 2%, this curve for 2% damping, it's given for us, shown. For TN 1.59, the D, 
0.5 and a is 0.2 as we said here and here as we found it here so the peak deformation as you know is going to be 5 inches this is the first requirement in the example this is the first example in the uh, the first requirement in the example okay now let's go to the second so now we have u equal to d equal 5 inches the peak value of equivalent static force is going to be this is the peak value of the static force now it is going to be a over g the peak acceleration over the ground acceleration times the weight okay because weight over g it is what yes it is the mass so acceleration times mass okay so it's 0.2 times mass which is 5.2 kips mass then it it would give us 1.04 kips force okay then the pending moment the bending moment at the bottom of the uh, cantilever if this is the cantilever here okay so the bending moment if we have the force here is 1.04 then the moment okay is going to be with this value which is um, uh, 1.04 times the 12 feet so it is going to be 12.48 this is the moment then the stresses if we're talking about the stresses is going to be mc over i m is 12.48 times 12 because we are talking about feet we we want to make it in uh, kilo uh, in uh, kips per square inch okay so we multiply it by 12 here times 4.5 over 2 this is the outside diameter over 2 because we are talking about this point or this point so if we are going to talk like this so c is this this point here okay so 4.5 over 2 and i 7.23 it is given for us already it is given for us already okay okay now this is the value of the stress which is 46.5 ksi okay whether at, at a or b or any point around the perimeter because we have the perimeter actually so it is any point we do not know where the direction would be okay, if it's coming from here or here or so any point it would be okay this is the note for for this anyway we are interested in 46.5 remember this value okay remember this value so the answer the answer for our uh, the deformation peak deformation it is five inches and the bending stress we're talking about bending stress it is giving us 46 i think 46 point something so these are the two answers here okay now let's go to the next example and keep in our mind what we have done before okay the stress computed in the example one the previous example let's assume that it exceeded the allowable stress and the designer deci decided to increase the size of the pipe to 8 inch remember that the size was 4.5 inch before so let's assume that the forces applied on the system has increased and uh, have increased and the allowable stresses or the allowable stress has been exceeded so the designer is going to increase the cross-sectional uh, diameter or the diameter of the cross-section okay in order to reduce the stresses let's see about let's see this so remember it was 4.5 we turned it to 8 inches okay the properties of this 8 inches is the the outside diameter 8 point something inside diameter 7.9 T the thickness is 0.3 and I is going to be 72.5 okay so before for 4.5 it was 7 point something here 72 point something almost like 10 times the inertia has been increased okay now comment on the advantages and disadvantages now the example is that you have a cross section and you found that the stresses was uh, uh, have been increased and you need to or you want to increase the diameter so that the stresses would be decreased right let's check this let's check the option of increasing the diameter whether it's good for us or not in a similar fashion we are going to follow the same steps that we have done in the first example we're going to calculate k and omega n so k 3 times ei over 
El, it is given for us, everything is given for us, and this is the inertia, new inertia, so it is 2.11, and for omega n, it is going to be k over m for us, and we found that tn is 0.5. Remember that T is 0.5. Before, can you remember that? What is the value of T? Yes, T was 1.59. So here it is 0.5. Before it is almost 1.6. So when we increase the diameter of the pipe, the natural period is increasing. Right? Okay. Let's go now from the spectrum. Okay, in this figure, which is this figure, the same figure actually, let's go with t equal to 0.5, the new t, and let's go to the points. We have here d is going to be 2.7 and a is going to be 1.1g. So we have d 2.7 and a is 1.1g. Do you remember this? d before it was 5, right? So the peak displacement decreased and this is something positive. And acceleration, do you remember how much acceleration it was before? It was 0.2 something, as far it is written here, yes, it was 0.2. So it is 0.2 g. Here, it comes to be 1.g. What do you think about this? Yes, the acceleration increased. This means that the forces would be increased. Let's see this through the calculation. So now D is 2.7, already we know about this. Now the force that is going to be uh, developed, it is going to be 1.1 times the weight, okay? Actually, weight over G, because we have here G, okay? So it is, this is, this is the, the supposedly to be the mass, okay? Or the weight over G, they are the same. And this gives us 5.7. And now, this 5.7, this is the, 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 the force that is going to be developed in, this is F, so the force, okay? M base is going to be this force times the height of the cantilever, it is 68 or something, and then the stress or the bending stress is going to be MC over I, I is larger, and this is C, 8 point something over 2, the outside diameter over 2, and this is the moment, which is already we have explained here. And times 12, take care of the units conversion. We found it how much? 49. Before it, it was how much? 46. 46 something. <laughs> so this means that increasing the diameter from 4 point inch to 8 inches is not going to help us in bending, in bending stresses. <laughs> It is going to worsen the situation. The bending stresses is going to be increased. So we need to take care in our design regarding this issue. Okay, that increasing the stiffness or increasing the diameter, okay, from smaller to bigger one may not help us very much in the final stresses. Okay, so this is the comments that I want to highlight. Using the 8-inch diameter pipe decreases the deformation from 5 inches to 2.7 inch inches. However, contrary to the designer objective, the bending stress increases, increases slightly, okay? Increases slightly from 46 point something to 49, I guess, okay? This example points out an important difference between the response of structures to earthquake excitation and to fixed value of static force. Yes, that's right. The designer used the concept of fixed value for static. He used it as fixed static force, as if the, the, the system is uh, having force, and then we need to increase the, the value here. But actually, no. If you're going to increase the value, the stiffness would increase, and the force applied would increase. The force coming from response spectrum or from the earthquake is going to be higher. In the static case, the stress would decrease, obviously, by increasing the member size. That's right. This is common. Okay? This is in the static case. But in dynamic case, no, not, it's not a condition. Okay. In the case of earthquake excitation, the increase in pipe diameter shortens the natural period or the natural vibration period from 1.6 to 0.5. 
which for this response spectrum has the effect of increasing the equivalent static force. That's right. So this equivalent static force has been increased. Okay, take care of this. Whether the bending stress decreases or increases by increasing the pipe diameter depends on the increase in the section models. That's right, which is I over C. And the increase or decrease in, in the force, it depends on what? Yes, on the sp response spectrum. That's the thing that I want you to understand. Okay, now let's go to another example that is going to be also give for us uh, some insight into what we have explained up till now. So a small one-story reinforced concrete building is, util is uh, idealized for purposes of structure analysis as massless frame. Massless frame means that there is no masses for the beams, okay? Uh, beams and columns, unless that we have concentrated force here, which is 10 kips. A total dead load of 10 caps at the beam level, as you can see here in this figure. Okay. The frame is 24 feet wide and 12 feet high. 24, 12. Each column and the beam has 10 inch square cross section. All of them, they are 10 inch. Assume that Young's modulus is 3 times 10 to the power 3 KSI, and the damping ratio for the building is estimated as 5%. We are talking about 5% here, not 2%. Okay, take care of this. Determine the peak response of this frame to L central ground motion. So this is, we want the peak response. So number one. In particular, determine the peak lateral deformation. We want the peak lateral deformation at the beam level and plot the diagram of bending moments at the instant of peak response. So we are going to solve it and go with the same steps that we have done before. Solution. As usual, we are going to get stiffness, then we are going to obtain natural period, then from the figure we are going to obtain the maximum, or from the response spectrum we are going to obtain the maximum lateral displacement. This is the strategy for, for us. So K, it is going to be, for our case, the lateral stiffness of such frame was calculated before, actually in, in, you can find that K for simple frames like 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 the one that is already in our case you can obtain it through this uh, formula okay you can find it you can find it in chapter one in chopra uh, fourth edition i think so you are going to find find this or you can calculate it by yourself because we have the cross-sectional area of the columns and beams so k is easy to be obtained which is this value 11.48 the natural vibration period is going to be 2 pi over the square root of k over m as we know we know k we know m then we can obtain this is the stiffness i'm sorry and this is uh, mass it is 10 as given and 3 386 it is the gravitational acceleration then t is 0.3 then using t 0.3 and the damping ratio 0.05 we read from the response spectrum the maximum displacement and the maximum acceleration as these values. Let's, let's see. So this is 0.3 here. Then we go. We have many response spectra here. This one, the first one, it is zero damping ratio. The second one is like 2%. And the third one is 5%. So we are interested in the third one, this one. Whenever you got the plotting, you are going to find this is the value for pseudo acceleration, and here this is the deformation, so you can obtain them easily. Going back, our deformation for D, it is 0.76, A, it is 0 0.76, 0 0.67 here, and 0.76G here. So the peak deformation is 0.67, as we said. Equivalent static force is going to be, as usual, V. Um, this the acceleration ratio times the weight directly which is 0.76 times 10 given to us so these are the static force static analysis of the frame for this lateral force shown in this figure gives the bending moments that are plotted here let's go here this is the force that we have obtained based on the maximum acceleration and this is the maximum bending moment in the columns and beams 
based on this force. Okay, it is simple static analysis uh, frame. You can obtain this value. Anyway, this is the bending moment. Okay, that we are obtaining here. This is the equivalent static force, and this is the bending moment diagram. Okay, so that's that's it actually for our case here. Okay, for for this we could because we want the peak lateral deformation and we want to find the bending moments at the instant of the peak response at the instant because we are talking about the peak only at the point at the peak okay now let's go and make some modification for this for this system in the next example and see what will happen okay the frame of example 3 which is the previous frame is modified for use in a building to be located in a sloping ground shown so we found that sloping ground so it was like they, they were like horizontal like this but we found that sloping ground so we have increased the length of one of the columns as you can see the beam is now made much stiffer than the columns and can be assumed to be rigid okay the beam considered to be very rigid okay the cross sections of the two columns are 10 inch square so the cross section are similar for this column and this column as before but their length are 12 and 24 so it is 12 and 24 okay 12 and 24 determine the base shears in the two columns so we want to know what is the base shear that is going to be developed here and what is the value of the base shear that is going to be developed here the first question that would pop up in your mind is that the base shear would be the same actually no it will not be the same they are different in length so they are going to attract different forces at the bottom take care of this so this is why we need to determine the base shears in the two columns at the instant of peak response due to the el centro ground motion the word peak response the instant of peak response means that we will go to the response spectrum and get the maximum acceleration and then we can multiply the acceleration by the mass of the system to obtain the force okay assume damping ratio five percent so we're going to use the same five percent damping okay let's go with the same procedure compute natural vibration period k it is known for you okay it is known for you fixed fixed system okay and we have because we have here it is rigid here and he said to us that the beam is going to be rigid so as if it is fixed fixed beam the fixed fixed so we have two columns this is the first one and this is the second the second one so one with 12 another one with 24 and we can calculate both we found that it is 11.31 tn is going to be 2 pi the square root radical of the the mass is here and the stiffness is here as we said this is all of this related to 2 pi over tn okay and this equal to k over m this is what you should remember always it will solve everything for you then we found that it's 0.3 actually it is the same as the previous example we have explained before it was 0.3 now from this 0.3 we are going into are going to the response spectrum and we will get D and A, right? So going back here, so it is also 0.3, so we are going to have the same values as we had before. So it, yes, it is D, 0.67, and 0.76 for A. So we are going to use them in the same example here. Yes, D, 0.67, maximum peak, displacement and maximum peak acceleration as you can see it here so based on this take care so k short which is the short column we have short column stiffness which is this one and we have long column stiffness which is this one so k short is times u node which is the maximum displacement if we have something like this and then it will it will move like this is fixed this distance it is u node which is the maximum so then the v short this is the, the force that is going to be developed at the bottom of 
the short column, which is stiffness of the short column times the maximum displacement that is going to be going to take place. Okay, so we have we have like the two. So uh, let me put it here. So we have two. One is short, and the other one is long. So both of them they are going to. Okay, they are going to move with the same displacement because the, the beam is rigid. So both of them are going to go with the same D. But the base shear here is going to be different than the base shear here. Okay, understand? So K long is going to be 1.2. Look here, the stiffness of the long column, much, much more less than the stiffness of the short column. That's right. Whenever that you have like short column like this, it's much stiffer than long column like this. So this is much more less stiffness multiplied by the same displacement, as I said here, the same displacement. It will displace laterally the same. The first short column is going to carry 6.73 base shear. However, the long column is going to carry 0.84, which is very negligible, smaller. In this okay but what is the point here let's comment on this uh, example by the these two comments observe that both columns go through equal deformation that's very important as I said they go through the same lateral displacement because the beam is, is rigid undergoing equal deformation the stiffer column carries a greater force than the flexible column the lateral force is distributed to the elements in proportional to their relative stiffness. Exactly. We have short column with very large stiffness and we have another long column with very small stiffness. Then the short column would carry, okay? uh, carry more. Sometimes this basic principle has inadvertently not been recognized in building design leading to unanticipated damage of the stiffer elements. And that's very important. So whenever that you have su such kind of frame, and all of a sudden you are going to, they are having the same cross section, but all of a sudden you need to go and make it longer column here. This column would not carry more. This column would carry, uh, this column would carry less, this column would carry more, okay? This is the end of this, uh, this video. I hope that you understood well uh, the response spectrum. This would be the last video in response spectrum. Uh, and I hope that you uh, will get uh, more through going through this video. Uh, and you can stop anytime and you can repeat it again. So uh, I think that it is important for you to watch this video uh, more than one time. I know that it's a little bit heavy. But anyway, if you repeat watching it, I think that you are going to get uh, more uh, information. Thank you and see you in the next video.